The British Army. To an outsider, it looks like one single fighting force. In reality, it's divided into more than 40 independent regiments, each with its own culture and traditions. And if you want to understand the British Army, these regiments are the best place to start. In this program, we go back nearly 100 years to meet a special unit of mechanics, plumbers and electricians, brought together to break the stalemate of World War I. This was a new kind of fighting force that would revolutionize warfare for the modern age. This regiment isn't one for pomp and ceremony. It's not about bright colors and bright parades. Its roots are in battle, in, in the mud and the blood, and in the grease inside of a tank. You know, that is what this regiment's all about. Black beret, black belt, black mafia, as we call ourselves, all sat together. You do get that, that certain pride. It's a really special bond that you don't find in, in other regiments. The first tank crews were a new type of soldier for a new secret weapon. To be in an environment like this, uh, I, I generally do not see how you can uh, survive, let alone complete an objective. This would just be dreadful. These courageous pioneers would lay the foundations of a regiment that has adapted to the changing threats of the modern world and remains at the forefront of armoured warfare to this day. No one wants to mess around with a fully loaded 80 tonne, fully armoured, ready to rock and roll tank. This is the armoured fist of the British Army, the Royal Tank Regiment. Target go on. Fire him. The 20th of November 2010, 6.20 a.m. The Royal Tank Regiment is celebrating the most important anniversary in its calendar, the First World War Battle of Cambrai. At this time, on this day in 1917, fighting began. Here at the regiment's barracks in Suffolk, the day begins with the officers and senior NCOs waking their soldiers and serving them tea laced with rum. Known as gunfire tea, it's a tradition dating back to World War I when officers gave their men some Dutch courage before battle. The men of the Royal Tank Regiment celebrate Combray Day wherever they are and whatever they're doing. These tankies are training on Salisbury Plain. It's quite fitting that my squadron's out on exercise and uh, the regiment hierarchy to bring us all our speaking buddies and cup of tea is a fairly rare occurrence. Are we can, right, Staffy? Thank you, sir. Every year we celebrate it. I've celebrated it now for 21 years. Gunfire in the morning, the uh, rum in the tea, and it wouldn't feel the same when it come round November the 20th if we didn't celebrate it. This year, Combray Day is also being celebrated in Afghanistan. Wherever we are, you know, we do it. It's great. <laughs> the Royal Tank Regiment is a combination of two regiments known as 1RTR and 2RTR with nearly a thousand soldiers and 40 officers between them. Have a Cambrai tasty morning. The celebration of Combray Day is a powerful way to bind them together as a regimental family, united by bonds formed nearly a hundred years ago. In the first months of the Great War, Cavalry charges and mass infantry assaults had failed in the face of trenches, machine guns and barbed wire. Europe was deadlocked in a war of attrition. First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill was looking for a way to break through the German trenches. 
We must crush them in, he said. It is the only way. I'm certain it can be done. In response to his demands, work began on a new kind of secret weapon. The land ship. In early 1916, adverts appeared in the motorcycle magazine, inviting men to volunteer for something called the Hush Hush Army Section. The army also identified potential candidates among serving officers. Victor Huffam, a second lieutenant with the Norfolk Regiment, had previously worked for a car manufacturer. I'd been called to the adjutant's office and shown the following. War office, strictly secret and confidential. Volunteers are required for an exceedingly dangerous and hazardous duty of a secret nature. Officers with an engineering background should have their names submitted. Basil Henriquez of the East Kent Regiment was another recruit. We learned that a profoundly secret unit of the machine gun corps was being formed, but were given no hint as to its purpose. The new recruits to the Hush Hush Army section were soon building the foundations of the Royal Tank Regiment. <laughs> Lieutenant Rory McCulloch has been in the regiment for one year. He commands a Challenger II, one of the most sophisticated weapons in the British Army. I'm in at the moment in the uh, commander's seat. I've got my uh, primary sights and various uh, commander's tools around me. These A's, I'm, I'm sorry to say, are, um, are mainly classified, so I can't actually show you those. Um, sat in front of me, right by my knees, is my gunner. And then in front of him, he has his gunner control handles, effectively like a PlayStation. In the front uh, is the driver. It's pretty cramped in there as well for him. On the other side, that is the operator side, with our ammunition stacked up. He is the number two in the tank, and his job is to load rounds manually, ready to be fired. He's also in charge of perhaps the most important bit of the tank, that is the kettle. It takes six months for new crews to learn how to operate a Challenger 2. Lieutenant Pete Eden has been in the regiment for two years. The gunners here, you know, they train and train and train to the point where they can hit a target at 2,000 metres first time every time. Target stop. Corporal Gaz Harley joined the regiment six years ago. We like our recruits to be slightly smarter, uh, more intelligent. Test my cocks. The technical knowledge required on a tank is, is substantial, um, and so we look for a certain calibre of soldier to be able to operate the, the vehicle. In June 1916, the first 225 volunteers for the Hush Hush Army section began training in Norfolk. They were called the Heavy Section of the Machine Gun Corps. Among the mechanics and engineers, there was also a former mayor of Hythe, an explorer who just come back from the South Pole, and a circus trapeze artist. They were a ragtag bunch drawn in on the idea that technology could break stalemate and, and bring manoeuvre back to the battlefield. The Tankies Regimental March is a World War I song called My Boy Willie. It was chosen in honour for the early tanks. The first tank was known as Little Willie. Based on the design of a tractor, it had a top speed of four miles per hour. Little Willie was soon replaced by a much larger tank equipped with naval guns. It was called Big Willie. King George V was an enthusiastic fan of the tank. He attended three early trials of the invincible new British weapon. 
But this trial also revealed some worrying design flaws. Despite the king's concern, nobody told him that every member of the crew inside the tank was knocked unconscious. At the regiment's museum in Dorset, the curator is introducing some modern tankies to one of the first British tanks. This is the tank the British Army made the most of in the First World War. It's there to crush down the barbed wire. It's there to let our soldiers follow on behind, get into the German trenches without being held up. And of course, as it's sitting on the trench, it's got guns on the sponsons on the side. They can fire up and down the trench line, keep those German soldiers' heads down or take them out so that the vehicles coming on and the infantry coming on behind um, can get to the German trench without getting held up. My first impression of this tank is that the, uh, the armour is so thin uh, to the extent that there would be so many uh, bullets flying around that the chance of being uh, wounded by splash inside the vehicle is, is huge. You're right. Uh, it, it, it's, the guys inside are still very, very vulnerable. And on a shell-strewn battlefield, there's an awful lot of shrapnel metal flying around that can penetrate this vehicle. But it's only inside that modern tankies can fully appreciate the conditions faced by their predecessors. So, being the drive, if you want to move through up there, down to the front and on the left-hand side. So looking at the different crew positions, if we could work out where everybody should be, you're sitting in the commander's position, the driver would be sitting here, and at the moment you've got the hatches open so you can see where you're going. When you come under fire, those hatches are closed down, and you look through little glass periscopes that would be just above them. You can see it's fairly cosy, but these exhausts going through the roof will glow red hot. So inside here, you'll be starting to cook. And as you can see, the other six crew members are gonna to have to perch themselves around in the vehicle, either hanging on or uh, bash yourself against the metalwork inside. But if you fall against this engine, you're gonna burn yourself. It's a million miles away from where we are now. Like now, you've got radios, you've got IC where the, the whole uh, crew can communicate with each other, and that's like half the battle. But this is, this is uh, uh, I've got a lot of respect for the, for the guys that actually fought and died in these things. To hit a target must have been quite an achievement, considering the modern science systems we've got on the vehicle, being able to magnify targets to look at, thermal imaging, all the auxiliary sighting systems, commander's got a separate sight to the gunner, and here you're on your own with a small slit. It's, it's comparatively medieval, this machine. I mean, it, it's thrilling, genuinely, to be inside. You need to think that our forebears actually broke siege warfare in these vehicles in the First World War. But it is just eons ago in technology. In July 1916, on the first day of the Battle of the Somme, the British Army suffered nearly 60,000 casualties, the bloodiest day in British military history. After 24 days of fighting, the casualties had more than doubled to 136,000. The generals were desperate for a breakthrough. They decided to unleash their secret weapon ahead of schedule. The tank crews of the heavy section had been in training for just three months. But on the 15th of September 1916, 49 tanks crawled towards the front line near Fleur in northwest France. The Battle of Fleur began at dawn. I suppose mine is the first tank in history to have fired on the enemy. I must own that my heart was rather in my mouth. God help us, boys, I shouted as we moved on. As we approached, the Germans let fire at us with might and main. At first, no damage was done, and we retaliated, killing about 20. The surprise appearance of the tanks on the battlefield led a German newspaper to declare, the devil is coming. And the Hush Hush Brigade were front page news at home when the Battle of Fleur was reported a couple of days later. The heavy section was a huge propaganda victory. But the reality was different. In their early battles, the tank looked like a catastrophic failure. Perennial breakdowns left the heavy sections stranded. The tanks could barely maneuver in the mud. 
and they struggle to roll across the German trenches. Even the tank's steel armor failed to give the crews enough protection against German artillery fire. Many had to abandon their tanks. We were now getting too much attention from Jerry. There was an explosion, then fire, and I came round to find myself lying on top of my corporal. Now we were in no man's land. I knew I had to get him back. I fastened my belt to his, and as I crawled from hole to hole, he came with me. By November 1917, 270 tank crew had lost their lives. Churchill was bitterly disappointed by the failure to break through at Fleur. My poor land battleships, he said, had been let off prematurely on a petty scale. But he didn't lose faith in the heavy section. Twentieth of November, nineteen seventeen, Northern France. The heavy section had been supplied with powerful new tanks and given a new name, the Tank Corps. A year on from the Battle of Fleur, it was about to take part in a surprise attack near Cambrai, commanded by a charismatic new general. His arrival was noted in Major Gerald Huntback's diary. A lithe figure strode past the infantry and the rear rank tanks. Pipe aglow, and with an ash stick with a mysterious cloth wrapping tucked under his arm. Unheralded, unexpected and unattended, Brigadier General Ellis had arrived. Brigadier General Hugh Ellis was about to deploy a new tactic, the mass tank attack. He mobilised every tank available, nearly ten times the number used at Fleur. Before fighting began, General Ellis issued his battle orders to the tank commanders. One of them, Special Order No. 6, has become enshrined in the regiment's folklore. It's read out every year on Combray Day, wherever the regiment are, including Afghanistan. Special Order No. 6. Tomorrow the tank corps will have the chance for which they have been waiting for many months. What great on good going in the van of the battle. Special Order No. 6 signalled Ellis' intention to lead his men from the front into what he called the vanguard of battle. Almost unheard of for a World War I general. I propose leading the attack of the centre division. General Hugh Ellis, 1917. Some of the words, I think, uh, that we remember at Combray are, are particularly poignant uh, as we're out here on operations, uh, you know, and very much yeah, in the van of the battle, as, uh, as General Ellis said so many years ago. At 6.20 a.m., 378 tanks lined up along a six-mile front and rolled forward into battle. At last I could distinguish their hulking forms labouring up the ridges, all in line, indomitable and invincible monsters. The sense of foreboding for those men 93 years ago uh, must have been hugely intense. Uh, they, didn't, they didn't really know for sure whether or not uh, they were backing a winner. Every Combray day, the officers perform a play to explain the significance of the battle. Absolute secrecy and complete surprise are key to the plan. Mass use gives us the best chance of smashing the German line. The brown, red and green flag hoisted above General Ellis's tank, Hilda, had been hastily stitched together before the battle. The three colours that are represented through our regiment, the brown, red and green, uh, come from the First World War, come from um, the only colours that um, the commanding officer at the time could find, and he got them and he made them into our regimental colours. The mud, the blood and the green fields beyond is what it was um, supposed to represent. Deployed en masse for the first time, 
the tanks broke through the barbed wire, crushed German resistance and rolled across the trenches. The tank corps was now a British Army legend. In no man's land was early born at 60 in the day. From out the British lines there came the famous tank brigade. The Kaiser saw the fall, so on the soul the twenty rounds. He shouted out the top for what here comes the bogey man. In one day of battle, the tank corps advanced seven miles. To gain this ground without tanks would have taken months of hard fighting and slaughter. They took battles where, you know, feet and inches were won at the cost of thousands of men to miles and kilometres for hundreds. That was the technology and that is what the tank regiment brought to World War I. It alleviated some of the slaughter and, and brought manoeuvre back to the battlefield. To the regiment! Combray Day is also an opportunity for the regiment to celebrate the success of the first mass tank attack. <laughs> I think it's important we go back and celebrate that, especially for people who don't read a lot of history, who, who turn up at the regiment and, and won't know much about the, the regiment history. That was the first real time that the deadlock on World War I was broken, and it was the turning point in armoured warfare, the start of tank warfare, it's the birth of our regiment, showing what we could do, what tanks were able to do. After the First World War, the regiment adopted the motto, Fear Naught. Stand on him, On Combray Day, the same attitude is adopted in the fiercely competitive inter-squadron football tournament. and in the fun and games that follow in the evening. Celebrating the, the Battle of Cambrai, yeah. You can, you can get away with a bit of stuff that you usually wouldn't get away with. Although there is a rank structure and there is the way things are done. We can let our hair down and everyone can have a laugh, irrespective of who they are. In 1918, King George V became the Tank Corps' Colonel-in-Chief. They were renamed the Royal Tank Corps in 1923. A year later, he crowned them with the Black Beret. Here we've got some of the uniforms they would have been wearing in the First World War tanks. But very early on, the idea of the black uniforms comes in because so many of these brown uniforms, what you're really doing inside a tank is you're soaking up the grease and the oil so much. So the black was suggested as a way of hiding grease stains all the time. So in the 1920s, they start putting together this black uniform that you're wearing now, uh, and it does. It becomes a really iconic and distinctive part of the regiment. It, it speaks volumes about this regiment. You know, this, this regiment isn't one for pomp and ceremony. It, it's, it's not about bright colours and bright parades. It's about practicality. It knows exactly what its roots are. Its roots are in battle, in the mud, in the blood. Uh, and in the grease inside of a tank. You know, that is what this regiment's all about. On the eve of the Second World War, after an army restructure, the Royal Tank Corps finally became the Royal Tank Regiment. From Dunkirk to D-Day, the regiment fought in all major battles of the conflict. They spearheaded the invasion of Iraq, and in Afghanistan, it has deployed new armoured vehicles. We're still bringing manoeuvre to quite a static battlefield. The platform looks a little bit different today. Fundamentally, still on tracks, still armoured, and we're providing mounted close combat now to uh, Task Force Helmut. As the nature of warfare evolves, so too does the Royal Tank Regiment. They've spent the last decade dealing with the greatest security threat the world faces in the 21st century. Cope Hill Down in Wiltshire is a purpose-built British Army training ground for urban warfare. Today, soldiers from the tank regiment are taking part in Operation Fingal Finder, an exercise designed to train them for one of the regiment's latest roles. Nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare. 
Adaptability and innovation is central to our ethos. The Royal Tank Regiment was founded from the First World War from an innovative new technology, the tank, and we've adapted to the role because that is within our DNA. Hello? Is anybody in? This exercise simulates a chemical weapon search. And it's not just house to house. They also have to check out nearly two miles of sewage pipes. Obviously, fair to work down there. A very muddy stuff. We've already done 50 metres now, and both of us are knackered. There's about a kilometre to do, so it's going to be a long day. OK, I've got um, a couple of detonators strapped to a couple of them glass vials with powder in them. Six months ago, I was in that tank, and now I'm doing basically a scientific job, and we've become um, experts on it, basically. Uh, and no one else in the army could do what we do. After six hours of dirty work, there's also a breakthrough below ground. The pioneering band of mechanics, plumbers and electricians who took a new secret weapon to war nearly 100 years ago has become one of the British Army's most adaptable modern regiments. Every year on the Sunday closest to Combray Day, the Royal Tank Regiment marches to the Cenotaph on Whitehall. They are one of only two British regiments to observe their own Remembrance Sunday. The Remembrance Parades are, are so important to us. Getting together, being a shared unit, remembering um, both our past um, battles and our past glories. Royal Tank Regiment, <coughs> we'll remove headdress. You get all the old soldiers, the old veterans back in, all wearing that same cap badge. Remove headdress. It's nice to see that pride between us all, the shared experiences. It's uh, one of the most important things, I think. We lay this wreath in memory of our fallen comrades in the Heavy Branch Machine Gun Corps, Tank Corps, Royal Tank Corps, and Royal Tank Regiment. We are but a few guys on the end of it, a huge line of you know, illustrious characters that have been in the regiment, and we're just a small part of that, but hopefully we can then build on that and carry the regiment forward. Well, it's incredibly important to remember, and the main reason for that is so that when you're at that moment, the night before your, your action, your battle, when you're lent up against your armoured vehicle, in northern France, in North Africa, in Burma, or now in Afghanistan. You can remember that you're not the first in the regiment that have done that, and you're not alone in adversity. You have your crew members, your friends, your tight-knit group, which we have always striven to have at the forefront of our way of working together, and that you'll overcome, as has been proven by the regiment throughout history, you'll overcome your adversity and you'll win.